Get a load of that skill. Even the way that they walk is so cool. Oh yeah, work it, baby. Mm -mm -mm. There's always been something vaguely intimidating about Xenoblade Chronicles. Much has been said about just how big the game is, with tons of side quests, characters to meet, and a very involving plot. Like a newcomer trying to jump into a TV show that already has over a hundred episodes, it can be overwhelming. So when Xenoblade Chronicles X was lauded to be even bigger than the original, there's an innate fear that it's simply too immense for new players to handle. After playing X for over 85 hours, I can safely say that while it may be huge, it is extremely accessible to those willing to give it a try. In fact, it may be my favorite game of the year. But let me explain why. Xenoblade Chronicles X is a separate story from the original. While certain elements might be shared between the two, this is a completely new tale and no knowledge of the first is necessary. In the future, two alien races stage a massive battle around Earth, with the planet being caught in the crossfire. Though mankind was able to see this coming and constructed several arcs to escape the planet, many were destroyed in the chaos. But at least one was able to make it out. Unfortunately, one of the alien races caught up to them and forced the Ark to crash land on the unknown planet of Mira. While the city of New Los Angeles landed safely, the debris from the ship containing both important resources and humanity's history were scattered across Mira's five continents. This sets the stage for the player's character creation to later awaken and aid in the struggle for mankind's survival. I found the story of X to be utterly engrossing. While it begins a little slow, this is all done so that the player has a firm grasp of every necessary element. The stakes are laid bare and what needs to be done is spelled out. It gives a loose sense of purpose that carried me forward until the specifics of the story came to light. And the structure of the plot is genius, allowing each person to decide how much or how little they want to experience. The story can only be progressed by taking on story missions. These come in the form of events that provide payoff for what you've seen set up while exploring and taking on other missions. It also evolves what you can encounter, adding depth and new gameplay elements with each chapter. There are limits to how quickly the story missions can be taken on. Often, there are requirements that force players to explore a certain amount of a specific continent or do a side quest that will directly relate to the coming story elements. While I didn't do this personally, I can estimate that only doing the bare minimum to just progress through the main plot should only take around 40 hours. It's certainly an option, but I can't recommend giving up on all the other things that you could experience story-wise. Though I haven't finished the game yet to say conclusively whether the plot holds up the entire time, I can say that the story missions are very much event-focused. They make for some amazing set pieces and revelations, but are light on character development. However, this isn't a problem if you decide to take on even a fraction of the extra missions in X. Missions come in three forms, Basic, Normal, and Affinity. Basic missions can be found at the mission board and don't really offer anything story related. There will be a blurb about why you're doing the mission, but as soon as you complete it, the award screen comes up. They mainly ask you to gather a certain amount of materials or kill a certain number of enemies or take out a specific tyrant, which are stronger versions of regular enemies. It's a way to quickly earn money, experience, and affinity which I'll get into later, for your party. In addition, they can alert you to the beginning of normal missions that can also be found as question marks on the minimap. Normal missions are done for the various NPCs around New LA and have more heft to them story-wise. While in the beginning they feel pretty one-off, some will actually evolve based on your decisions during the quest. They're not voice acted, but do provide a better look at the daily lives of New LA residents. And because you create your own character, your decisions can directly affect how these missions play out. You can be completely supportive in their actions or take a more selfish route. But many of them have consequences. Doing something for one character might change the opinion of another, which shifts the way the mission is handled. I don't want to give away specifics, 
but I really felt like these fleshed out the world of X and gave the sense that everything was changing and adapting based on the choices and events that you went through. Finally, there are the affinity missions, which are given by the various party members. Like the story missions, there are requirements to access these. Sometimes a certain amount of chapters must be completed or a certain level must be reached, but you always have to build up the affinity between your character and your party members. If you only have one heart of affinity with Elma, you can't do the affinity mission that requires three hearts. Affinity is increased through battles, dialogue options that match their opinions, and simply completing a mission. Basic missions can often be the quickest way to build up affinity. Affinity missions are often my favorite in X. They are fully voice acted and provide the character development that the story missions lack. You'll often learn key facts about a character's past that you would otherwise never know. It's not required information, but it helps make the characters more than just simple tropes. These are people with issues and opinions that might help you see them in a completely different light compared to your first impression. The thing about affinity missions though is that the characters necessary for them are locked to your party until it's finished. I never found that to be an issue, but the other caveat is that a story mission can't be started until the affinity mission is completed. So if you're stuck, you have no choice but to finish it. Now this rarely became a problem, unless the mission was to gather certain materials. Unfortunately, there's no way to know where a material could be. Often you'll just be given the continent's name, and with how big they are and the fact that certain materials can only be found in certain areas, you could wander around for a long time with no way of actually finding it. Material gathering often became the most groan-inducing type of mission that I came across. I always seem to either have all of the material I needed or none of it. It just feels like a strange omission when you could end up stuck in an affinity mission with no way to continue until you find that one item. The strange thing is, there's a way this could have been solved. It's possible to earn reward tickets through squad missions, and again, I'll detail this soon. These can be used to redeem items, but only items that are dropped from the various monsters. There is no other way to get the materials that can be entered into the Collectopedia. They simply must be found in the world. So this affects the Collectopedia as well, where I was often struggling with whether I should register the item or save it for a possible future mission. In the end, I decided the best method was to register the material for the Lucky Spaces, which immediately provide battle points that can power up moves and skills. I would register the other spaces when I had every material in a category and doing this grants an even bigger battle points bonus. It's not a massive issue, but it does require you to keep all of this in mind when collecting material crystals across Mira. But like I said, despite these occasional problems, I really enjoyed the normal and affinity missions. The affinity missions gave character to people who don't even appear in story cutscenes. It makes them more than just mindless additions that you don't care about and normal missions give some of the strongest theming I've seen from a game like this in a long time. This is humanity on its last legs, struggling to survive. People die and each death weakens humanity as a whole. Your character is good, elite even, but this battle for survival requires everyone's help. You're not the one destined to save the world. You're a part of a team and the wide variety of recruitable characters emphasizes this. It's not just a theme of survival either. Much is said about fear of the unknown, races cooperating or outright despising one another, and even the place of religion. It's possible for you to foster a message of coexisting or outright hating the people you come across. Nothing is toned down. The themes being presented can truly resonate. It's a mature story that you can either take at face value or look a little bit deeper into but it doesn't come at the cost of levity. There are some really funny moments in the main story, in the affinity missions, and even in the normal missions. X strikes an excellent balance of seriousness, tragedy, and goofy humor. And that's just a story structure. I've barely mentioned the actual gameplay. Let's go back to squad missions first. Whenever starting Xenoblade Chronicles X, you can choose a squad to be part of. These squads have members that focus on the single player, focus on the squad missions, or members of your friends list. 32 players are placed in these squads and every so often a squad mission appears. The squad missions usually consist of gathering a certain type of item or killing a set number of a certain enemy. 
Each person who does this lowers the counter and earns a reward ticket. Fully completing one of these earns even more tickets. And this is all done with a real-time counter. It's a way to work together without being together. Another way X accomplishes this is by having the player choose a division to be part of. In the grand scheme, the divisions don't have that much of an effect. They mainly change what attribute gets a small boost as well as what activities earn more division points and blade points. Division points are mainly used as a competition with other divisions. Every so often the game will track how many were earned from every person in the division and ranked. The higher the rank, the better the reward. It's just a small aspect that occasionally helps you out, and while you can change your division, I never felt a need to. Blade points are much more important though, gradually increasing your character's blade level. With each new level, you are given more options to customize your barracks and can increase a field skill ability. Basically, whether or not you're able to access chest-like objects scattered around the world. Opening each one provides money, experience, and various items depending on the category and field skill level necessary. And considering they're one of the best ways to obtain special data probes, they are well worth tracking down. Data probes can only be accessed through the gamepad. It is possible to play with a pro controller, but you'll need to keep the gamepad close by for both the data probes and fast travel. The data probes can be found at specific points around Mira. Installing one requires a certain mechanical field skill level depending on the location, but doing so reveals that portion of the map on the gamepad. This shows the area's layout as well as what needs to be done to survey the surrounding hexagonal segments of the map. Special data probes can be installed to create battle effects, increase the amount of money earned, or mine unique materials and extra meranium. Again, I'll further explain meranium and surveying segments soon. The data probes are essential to effectively earning money in Xenoblade Chronicles X. There's a lot that can be bought, and much of it is pretty expensive. But when you have data probes providing more money every 20 minutes or so, you'll eventually be able to rake in enough to cover every cost. Each data probe point has differences too. Some are better suited for making money, while others for mining. And considering that chaining the same probes together can increase their effectiveness, there's a lot of leeway in order to best earn money and meranium. Once I had a clear idea of what I needed to do, I was able to easily rearrange my setup in order to almost double my profits. It's not a requirement to change any of the probes, but doing so helps immensely. The meranium that you do earn can be used in various ways. Some of the basic missions have you donating it to people around town, but it's primarily used to fund arms manufacturers and augmenting weapons. By funding the arms manufacturers, new equipment and weapons are added to the shop. And as you progress through the game, new ones are added that can provide completely new equipment and emphasizes different attributes. I found it completely possible to make one character very resistant to electrical attacks or to increase their evasion. This may decrease their overall defense, but it's perfect for specific challenges. So you can decide whether you want to change everything for each situation, or go for a more general setup that can handle most things. There's a lot of ways to play with how your team is equipped. And even if you find equipment that you like the stats for but hate the design, you can have the character wear something else instead so that they keep the positives but don't look silly. The equipment is also where augments come in. Many times a weapon or piece of armor will have bonuses that increase various stats, but that same piece of equipment could have an empty slot. With that, it's possible to place an augment of your choice inside. These can be found in the chests or made using meranium. Once you have it though, it's yours for good. You may set it in a torso piece, but then change to something else. Just remove the augment and set it anew. It allows players to experiment as much as or as little as they want. Every piece of equipment can also be upgraded using a combination of meranium and enemy materials. You can't upgrade it indefinitely, each one has a set limit, but this method will help you increase your stats without having to upgrade equipment right away or if you have an item that you really like. The customization options are numerous and at first a bit of a mystery. The game doesn't really teach you how to use augments, it's something I had to figure out for myself. But even then, I didn't really mind because by the time I attempted it, I had a firm grasp of what everything meant. I could experiment without being punished, and the basic things you have to do don't really require augments and the like. It's more about making you even more powerful or being able to stand up to some of the extra challenges earlier. 
As I said before, placing data probes reveals the hexagonal segment surrounding it. Completing the task within the segment marks it as surveyed and adds it to the completion percentage. Every area of the game has these segments marked on the gamepad and it can be downright addictive filling them in. The goals can range from finding a specific chest, to completing a normal or affinity mission that takes place there, to defeating that section's tyrant. I found completing each one to be really fulfilling since you get the sense that you're helping humanity survive. And there are even segments within New LA itself. Some are the same as the rest of Mira, but rather than tyrant segments, some ask the player to give opinions to civilians or having a heart-to-heart -heart with party members once their affinity is high enough. The entire system of exploration ties into everything else. I took on basic missions to earn money and experience. While doing that, I explored and set up data probes. This showed me what else was possible within those segments. So not only could I do missions and gather materials, but complete my survey. And running around New LA talking to everyone gave me a better sense of the characters, opened up new normal missions, and increased my affinity so I could do more affinity missions. I rarely felt like I was completely wasting my time while doing any of this. Then there's the combat. Like the original game, each character automatically attacks with the given weapon. No input is required of the player. Instead, it's more important to mind your placement and which abilities, or arts, you use and when. Players have two weapons at any one time, a short range and a long range. The short range weapons like knives and swords do one big hit of moderate damage. This also has the benefit of greatly increasing the amount of tension points, or TP, that are earned. However, it also draws the aggression of the enemy, making it more likely for you to be hit. This could be a good thing though depending on whether you want to draw attention away from your allies. It's all about paying attention to the situation. Conversely, long range weapons in the form of guns do several smaller hits for overall less damage, but many times the player can be out of reach of certain attacks. It also draws less attention to yourself at the cost of only obtaining 1 TP per bullet. Switching between the two methods is as simple as a button push, making it easy to adjust to whatever may be going on in battle. Players also must decide when the best time to use arts will be. It's possible to just fire them all as quickly as you can, but that's an extremely ineffective way of utilizing them, especially since there's a cooldown period after using each one. There are several different kinds of arts. Some are special attacks with the long range weapons, while others are for the close range weapons. There are buffs for your party and debuffs for the enemy, and even auras that can be activated for a short time. At its most basic, it's an easy to grasp system, but the complexity comes from how all of the different arts work together. One may make an enemy topple over, which then makes it weaker to another art that increases the damage done when an enemy is toppled. Another might be more effective when an aura is activated. You start with a limited selection, but as you progress, you unlock more and more, providing plenty of options to mix and match the best strategy for you. But other things must be taken into account. For one, some arts require TP to use, usually a thousand, so you must pay attention to your TP bar to know when you can use that more powerful attack. But TP is also at a premium, as it's the only way to revive fallen party members in battle. However, it's a very steep 3000 TP. Often it comes down to the choice of helping out an ally to double up the damage or using the TP to unleash an incredibly strong art. Like most things in the battle system, it all comes down to the situation you find yourself in. Arts can also be powered up in several ways. During battle, it can be saved while a second green bar fills around it. The green bar will only fill if the matching weapon is being used, adding extra elements to keep track of. If you are able to completely fill the green bar, then a bonus effect will happen for that art, either more damage or a better chance of something happening. Battles often come down to the question of patience versus need. Sometimes you'll want to save up a certain art, but your teammates will call for a specific kind of attack. Doing so increases the affinity with them slightly and boosts the teamwork of your allies. Occasionally, a circle will appear that closes in. Hitting B at the right time will heal your allies and increase the morale level, which boosts your allies' abilities. The second method of powering arts is battle points. Their levels can be boosted using these, making them stronger with shorter cooldowns and sometimes other effects. The arts at your disposal change depending on what class you choose. 
There are six different paths that can be taken, and each one focuses on different weapons and arts. But once you've fully mastered a path, the weapons and arts can be combined with the ones from other classes at your own discretion, potentially creating something entirely unique. Each class feels different and can range from being relatively simple to something that requires more thought. And that can be said for the battles themselves. Usually they end up being pretty short, but the longer fights are where your choices come into play. There's no punishment for death, so it's easy to try different tactics and see which one works best. A lot of this might sound complicated, but the game eases you in in such a way that you understand the basics, yet still want to learn more in order to be even better. It's a great system that toes the line between action RPGs and turn-based ones. Each level feels impactful and really matters in how strong you are. Of course, there are still the skills. These mechs not only open up more possibilities in exploration, but combat. What might simply be too big for you to handle on foot becomes a little more manageable in the scale, but they're not a solution to everything. If something smaller than it is still a high level, it can totally decimate your scale. Scale combat is different in that each weapon you buy adds a different art to use. In fact, those arts are probably more important than the stat boost you may receive from them. And while regular combat and on-foot exploration doesn't drain the scale's fuel, arts and the flight module that's eventually obtained does. So you must strike a balance between power, the arts, and your fuel consumption. An art may be super powerful, but if it drains too much fuel with each use, then it may not be for the best. Fighting while flying doubles that issue because the fuel slowly drains while you're in the air. Not to mention the fact that scales are incredibly expensive, not only to buy and equip, but to repair. Upon purchase, each scale has enough insurance to cover three destructions. After that, repairs must be done with pure cash or by obtaining a salvage ticket. Using the scales is a lot of fun, but I was always wary of losing one. If I ever saw that I was close to death, I would immediately jump out so at least it could survive. In a way, it's perfect at balancing how much you're on foot or in the scale. It's simply not a win button. Unfortunately, the most confusing aspect of the game is the multiplayer. At its simplest, it's possible to register your character at your current level for other players to essentially rent for two hours. If they're having trouble, they can use your character in order to take on whatever challenge. If your character is used, then you'll receive spoils from that experience. Time attack missions can also be unlocked and completed with players comparing their times. But the reason I call the multiplayer confusing is because I never found a way to directly play with other people. I know it exists in X, but the missions never became available. I suspect that it has some kind of connection to squad missions, but I can't confirm that. Essentially, I think it comes down to the fact that the servers are not very full since I played it before release. This makes it much more difficult to complete every task for the squad mission in time. Once the game is out to the public, multiplayer should be easier to access. Despite not being able to try it, it didn't feel like it was a big loss. The main game had more than enough to keep my interest. Multiplayer was essentially a potential bonus in my mind. It must be said though that the art design in Xenoblade Chronicles X is utterly gorgeous. Each continent is unique and even has a ton of variety within itself. It became a joy to explore just to see what kind of environment I would find myself in next. And the fact that the monsters all have their own patterns and schedules makes it feel alive. At one time of day they could be playing with each other or running across the map, while at others they're simply sleeping or eating. Even New LA is impressive despite the basic design. The way it changes in obvious and subtle ways as the story progresses is something to behold. Even a normal mission could change the makeup of the city. The world is absolutely massive, with a ton to see and the fact that there are no load times is even more impressive. While the opening load time can be a little long as well as the fast travel, it never felt like an annoyance. Everything was cohesive. But while the art design is fantastic, it's obvious the graphics are working overtime. Even with the free data packs, enemy and location pop-in is rampant. Many of the places are not as detailed as they seem from afar, and if you get too far away, such as flying, they don't seem detailed at all. But these are all minor complaints since the game's frame rate never stutters. Not only that, but I never once encountered a glitch or a bug. Maybe if the locations and enemies were more generic, it would be an issue for me. They're not, though. 
There's a ton of imagination on display, and it all looks incredible. The sound design immediately feels like it will split the opinions of many people. It has a different kind of soundtrack that emphasizes lyrics in many of the songs. Some will inevitably be annoyed by this, but I loved almost every song. New LA's theme pushed the idea of a bustling city. Silvalum's themes were mysterious and cool. Noctilum's were triumphant and exciting. Primordia's pushed the idea of starting a grand adventure. They all fit so well to me. Yes, they can become a little repetitive with the game being so long, but for my part, it never became that bad. There are some truly outstanding tracks. And I must also commend the voice acting. Though some may be disappointed at the lack of a Japanese vocal track, the English is almost universally excellent. Elma, Lin, and Lau are immediate standouts, each displaying what their character is all about. Some are genuinely funny and sell their roles so much that I don't think I would have cared without their performance. There are some weaker actors, but on the whole, I believe it's a fantastic package. Xenoblade Chronicles X is expansive, thought-provoking, funny, and so much more. There are small issues that pop up on occasion, but honestly the good is so good that I have trouble remembering the minor problems. Some aspects of the game could be more user-friendly, and it often leaves the specifics of different gameplay elements up to the player to figure out. But it never bothered me because it rarely outright required those extra bits. It's patient in letting players discover more about it and rewarding those that experiment. It's a good game if you do the bare minimum. It's a great one if you truly take the time to explore and immerse yourself in this world. And X even facilitates short play sessions. Playing for only an hour or two at a time still feels like progress is being made. Things are being done, and time isn't being wasted. It makes it very easy to jump in and just have some fun for a while. You might feel intimidated, but X allows you to go at your own pace. And for all these reasons, and so many more that I just can't talk about, I love this game. If you have even the tiniest interest in it, play it. I cannot recommend it enough whether you're new to the series or a seasoned Xenoblade player. Thanks for watching and stay tuned to Game Explained for more on Xenoblade Chronicles and other things gaming.